Hey everyone, welcome back to the Career Growth Podcast. Uh, for our regular listeners, I might sound a little different. That's because I'm not Kalis. And uh, Kalis today is taking a backseat from being a host and is going to be a producer on the show today. Uh, don't worry, this is very temporary. Um, he'll be back as a host next week and you'll hear from him soon. And um, anyone that listened to a first season, uh, my, son, my, my voice might sound a bit more familiar. I used to be a co-host on the podcast in the first season. And I'm back uh, just for a short episode. And uh, today with me, I have an amazing guest. Um, she has been working with us for a little while. And one of my colleagues has been raving about her for, for I don't know, I think it's been a few months now. And she keeps saying, you have to get her on the podcast. And so today with me, we have uh, Beatrice Cord from Endeavor. And uh, how are you doing today, Beatrice? Hey, I'm doing really well. Thank you. And thank you for having me. No problem at all. So, um for um for our guest for the purpose of our guest i'll just kind of briefly introduce your background um i'll just touch upon a few things and uh uh at the same time i don't want to kind of fully go over your background so uh so beatrice is someone um who has got two undergrad degrees went to grad school and uh started working in l'oreal then went on to being an advisor to her country's mission at the UN and so on and so on and so on. And obviously I'll let Beatrice kind of go through all those things. Uh, her diff it's, it's actually a really, really impressive background. So um, without me kind of explaining your background, could you just like briefly walk us through your career in your twenties and what that entailed? That's so funny. Walking here, I was listening to this song of uh, Miley Cyrus. Um, I know I used to be crazy, but that's, that's because I used to be young. And, uh, it's a song that uh, really represents, I feel like, me and where I am right now in, in my life, which is like mid-30s. Um, yeah, my, my early 20s were about exploration. So I did a lot of things. But that was because my mantra was try everything um, and really go and, you know, taste a little bit of like every different career path or interest that, that I had at that point. So... Initially, I wanted to work in advertising. That was my big dream in high school. Um, so I went to advertise, like the advertising school in Romania. And, you know, it was in collaboration with Leo Burnet, which was a huge advertising company, like globally, especially in the US. Um, sure. And I had like my first, I think my very, very first job was in PR, you know, you know, small PR and advertising company. And it lasted like for probably like a month or something because... I don't know. I like I, I was like I had to like write a press release for the entire time, and I was like, "This is crazy. I can't do this for like my." Uh, so that's how I, I got to L'Oreal, um, where I was doing like a little bit more like marketing and like a bunch more more creative work. Um, and in parallel, I was also studying law because my parents thought advertising PR is not the real job. And you know, like 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't really like like people weren't talking about this career especially like pr and communications my mom at some point asked me so do you want to like talk to people like what's what's this whole like communication idea right um so i was studying law and you know i at some point i got really frustrated because i just wanted more the crisis came like the budgets were cut so i was like okay i want to i want to go and study in, in the uk in london um there's where like i completely changed my mind about pr and advertising and i started and also like marketing um, although I still think they're like incredible things to do for me, it was just like, it's a bit too superficial. I want to go deeper. I want to see like what I can do more. Um, so I went a little bit like towards diplomacy and I started like kind of like playing with this idea of like being a diplomat. I studied diplomacy. Um, I then came to the, to, to the, to New York to work for the United Nations. That was my dream, dream job. Not because I thought the United Nations is like the best. <laughs> I think it has like a lot of goods and a lot of bads and, um, I was doing my entire thesis on the bats, actually, like on what the United Nations is not, you know, achieving. Um, so I, but I wanted to do multilateral diplomacy. For me, that was like why I really wanted to be here. I came here, I worked as a, you know, as a diplomat, as an advisor for the Romanian mission. And then I started working for the UN, organizing what is called the Youth Assembly at the UN, one of the biggest platforms for young people all over the world to come and understand what the UN is. Um, and then from there, I kind of like transitioned into more of a consultancy role, um, doing a lot of like youth empowerment uh, and nation branding type of um, platforms and events around the world. Um, it was fantastic because I got to be like, you know, why I wanted to be a diplomat was mainly because I wanted to, to understand, to travel, to discover the world. So sure. in this consulting role, I actually 
got to do a lot of that. So, you know, I went to Saudi Arabia when Saudi Arabia was completely closed. You couldn't visit as a tourist. Um, I went to, you know, a lot of the other countries in the Middle East. I went to to Latin America, to Europe, back to Europe. I'm originally from Europe. So I think that's that's always been like a little bit of like my desire to be between the two continents. Um, sure. And it was great because I got to do these incredible conferences to connect people. Um, and, you know, the more I was doing it, the more like my, my desire to do more on my own started like happening. So it was like a natural transition at some point when I was like about to turn 30, like towards the end of my 20s, um, to really go into to entrepreneurship and try different things on my own. And I, I did that for a while. Um, and now I am working for Endeavor. Um, and what I kind of like, like to say is like I'm an entrepreneur turned intrapreneur because an Endeavor is a global organization supporting its buy for uh, high impact entrepreneurs. So basically we're supporting, selecting, um, you know, helping entrepreneurs from especially emerging markets, but not only um, to really like, you know, do their magic and to to have this multiplier effect and to, to really like change their economy. So that's a little bit about, you know, my 20s transitioning into my 30s. And thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that. Okay, we're going to kind of go through some of those in a bit more detail. So um, when I last did the podcast, a lot of the hosts, oh, I mean, a lot of the guests that I had on the po uh, podcast rather, were entrepreneurs. And so it's great to have someone who perhaps had like a slightly more traditional background. And so I'm really intrigued. I have a lot of questions for you, Beatrice, and um, it's going to be interesting. So for anyone that's not familiar with my background, I studied law. So there's a little bit of an overlap. This, when you kind of went through your background, there's a few things that I was like, oh, okay, there's quite a lot of similarities here. So I studied law, uh, didn't complete it. I started the company with my co-founder uh, in our first year, towards the end of first year. And then we dropped out towards the end of our third year. So, and then we've been working on uh, CP since 2012 so it's been 12 years so uh, I'm practically unemployable at this stage so it's great to see kind of someone who has gone through different roles and I have so many questions so we'll come to that um, so to kind of go back a little bit and rewind to kind of your career LB um, and L'Oreal and your UN so I would probably say that's probably like your beginning or like mid-20s so um, a lot of our listeners would love to know um, a what was the kind of process of getting into organizations like back because I think I would probably say LB and L'Oreal are probably kind of like private companies and obviously uh, similar in a lot more ways than someone like being an advisor to your country's mission to the UN. So uh, by the way, on that topic, did you have a diplomatic passport, by the way? I only heard about this. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I wasn't like, by the time I would have gotten my passport, I left. Oh, okay. Oh, shame. Diplomatic visa, which is pretty much the same. <laughs> okay, sure. For anyone that's not familiar, do you want to just tell them what a diplomatic passport is or a diplomatic visa is? Yeah, I mean, it's when you're a diplomat for your country, when you represent your country, you basically do not belong to any of the countries where you work in. So, for example, if you work in the U.S., you have this diplomatic passport or diplomatic visa, which means that you don't, I don't know, normally when you come to the U.S., you need a tourist visa or a working visa, and that's given by the U.S., right, by the U.S. State. Yeah. On a diplomatic visa, the diplomatic visa is an agreement between the countries, especially with the UN. So UN is almost like a country in a, in a city. So the UN building is its own neutral space. It doesn't yeah. belong to the US. It's just on US grounds. Um, and having this passport means that you don't, you don't pay taxes. You have like a separate line in the airport. You probably all saw that line for like diplomatic personnel, like, you know, people. Um, it is just like easier because you don't, you don't have to pay taxes here, you don't have to file taxes, you don't have to, but then like a lot of other things, right? You don't have a social security in that country because you do not work for that country, you just work sure. in that country, but you completely belong to either your country or the international organization. You also have a diplomatic passport if you work for the UN, so you don't, you can work for the UN and also get one. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool. Uh, I do like the concept. I think yeah. the whole... Um, cheaper. <laughs> yeah, like I think it's a lot harder to... <laughs> Yeah, the taxes, um, I think the police will treat you very differently as well, right? Yeah, uh, you they're not, I mean, they can stop you, but if you show the diplomatic passport, um, they, they're not allowed to, like, fine you. They have to report you back to the police of your country in a way. So then you kind of like, so you're, yeah, you're a little bit exempt, obviously, if, like, bad things happen or if you go, but, like, if they just stop you for, because you, you were driving too fast, they yeah. cannot actually, like, fine you. I'm sure the number of people that just search for diplomatic passports just shot up on Google. So thank you so much for that. So anyway, I, I kind of got sidetracked there. So coming back to 
uh, your early 20s. So um, do, you, do you remember the process that you kind of went through? And um, it, it would be great for a lot of our listeners to kind of like, obviously, I fully assume that some of the processes might have changed. But uh, what was it like applying to organizations like LB, L'Oreal, and then we'll come to the UN completely separately, or at least your mission, your country's mission to the UN? So just just a caveat, I didn't work for the LB. It was just like he, they had a partnership with my university. So it was like I the see. university was under him. I worked for another another advertising company that I'm not even sure they're around because a lot of them have been bought up and so on. I did work for WPP, which is the biggest conglomerate um, in like advertising communications and so on. What was like, it's very interesting. So uh, the first job in PR that I got, I was, so first of all, I studied during my university. So I was, stu- I, I worked, sorry. So I was studying and working at the same time, which is something sure. that I don't know how it is in Romania. You can do that. I think in the US it's much harder, but in Romania you can hundred percent combine them. I mean, it's a lot of work. I used to like sleep very, very little, uh, but I did, I did work while I was, I was studying. Um, so I was like early twenties when I had my first job in, in PR. And these were my first real jobs. I had other jobs before I got to university. I won't go into those because those are sure. just like big money. Um, so my first job in PR, I think I got it honestly through participating in different um, networking type of events and meeting people and then, you know, applying for these internship opportunities. I think when you're in school, it's actually super cool because it's very easy to get into an organization through an internship, right? Um, most of the companies easier. Are- I'll probably say. So they're looking for, they're not paying internships, but they're looking for the talent. So they're sure. willing to like open up because they want, they need, they need a the talent. They need, I mean, even now I'm, I'm looking for interns for the summer um, because I, you know, it's fantastic. Like they're super smart. They're willing to like prove themselves. And, you know, it's a great opportunity to, to, to have like a lot of the work that you need to have done. done. So I think it's, it's, I always say it's probably easier to get into an organization, especially like, these like bigger corporations or so on when you're super young and then yeah. like grow from there, which is something I didn't do. <clears throat> I have a lot of friends who, you know, got into incredible positions just by the fact that they started as an intern and then just stuck with the organization. And, you know, naturally they progressed to incredible executive levels. Um, so that's what I did. I, I, I'm, I, I love networking. I've always loved meeting people, talking to people and that, you know, from a very early age, I was pretty like outgoing. Um, and I remember like I met the person who was running this organization or like she was like one of the leaders of the organization of the PR company um, in a student type of conference. And okay. then, you know, she published the job. I applied. I had an interview with her. So it was like the the whole process. I got that. And then the L'Oreal thing in Romania at that point, um, the the job fairs started coming. Okay. So you started having these companies, um, you know, coming to campuses and just like, adver- which is 100% something that is still very, very strong, even now in the US. But I think it's also like getting more stronger in other parts of the world. And Romania was kind of like slow into that. But but yeah, I went to a job fair and there was this booth of L'Oreal and this person who was presenting L'Oreal. And I remember like I already had a job. So that's a very funny story because I already had this job with a PR, but all of my colleagues didn't have a job and they were desperate. L'Oreal is a great employer. To be honest, it's a great place to learn and to grow. Um, So they were desperate to get a job with L'Oreal. And I was like not even interacting with the guy because I already had a job. So I was just there to support my friends. And I was like, kind of like sitting there and he was like, what about you? And I was like, oh, no, no, I already have a job. He's like, well, maybe you want to still apply. I was like, no, no, I I have my dream job because that was I thought that was my dream job to work in PR and in advertising. Right. And they're like, well, we have positions in PR and advertising, too. So maybe you want to apply. No, no, I'm I'm fine. Don't worry. So I completely like blew here. Like I was like, no, I'm super cool. I don't need you. Um, and then I went, I started this job, but like, he still gave me his card or something. He was like, well, sure. if anything happens, cause I was my, in my first year of university. So he thought maybe in your second year or whatever. Um, so he gave me his card and then I went on, I started my dream job and my dream job proved to be like, not dreamy at all. As, as I said, I mean, it was great. It's just, it wasn't, I just didn't feel, and when you're so young, I feel like it's really like my advice is don't stay when you're super young, the world mm. is yours. So don't stay in anything that's not feeling like, right. Um, sure. so I, I, ca- I called the guy, I was like, hi, do you still have the position? Because I actually, I want it. He's like, well, we don't have the PR and, and you know, the PR one, we do have the marketing one. And I remember I went in and I had, like, he set me up, like I had the first interview with him. He was a human resources person. And then he set me up with the director of the, like, there was this small kind of like department. Um, okay. 
he basically set me up with him and it was like he became my mentor it was one of the most incredible interviews of my life and he was also like the person who encouraged me to like leave the organization and go study and do other things and you know i kept meeting him throughout throughout my career he, he was this french guy super creative his office was like full of like old like um, hair things because it was like a, the, the department was about like hair products um yeah, that makes sense I, I completely loved it and I, you know, I, I joined this organization as a, it wasn't even an internship, it was actually like a real job, a junior job, but like a real job because they were, they were launching a new product and they just needed someone to, to do it. And yeah, I loved it. I did fashion shows. I did like a bunch, like a new magazine. I, you know, it was like a, an amazing run. I met some incredible people that I still am in contact with. Uh, and I remember when I first, I was going to work every day and my colleagues were like, you're so young. I was like 21 mm. or something. And they were like, you're studying. Like, why are you working? Like, you shouldn't be here. You should be like studying. And I was like, no, because it, it, I started in the summer. So it was supposed to like be a summer type of thing. But then I just kept going. Sure. Um, and they were like, yeah, like, you know, I, I just kept going because I loved it. And at some point, my mom was super afraid that I was missing my school because of working like full time. And I remember she would come next to the building and she would be like, I'm just going to go there and say like, you're not allowed to work. And I was like, mom, <laughs> I'm over 21. So you cannot really do anything. Um, but yeah, I, I really love that. But that's how I did it. Like networking, fairs, meeting people and just, you know, putting yourself out there. I ha I must say, I never really applied for a job directly in, mm. in like, like LinkedIn, for example. I mean, yes, I've applied, but it wasn't ever something that actually worked out. I feel like for me, it was always like meeting people, you know, yeah. that somehow lead you into like that role or like figuring out like, oh, I love this organization. Who do I know from this organization that I can, you know, talk with? So I think like for me, that's and it, it kept working. I think that was not just in my 20s. It was like all throughout my life. It gives you a slight advantage, right? Because knowing someone and having someone internally that could potentially vouch for you and yeah. say, oh, I've met Beatrice and... Uh, she was quite impressive and she completely blew me off, but I think we should still kind of yeah. speak to her. <laughs> so, uh. I mean, to be honest, it's it's one of those things, right? Like you receive, and even now with AI, I think it's even worse, like mm. hundreds of applications, right? Like they're like piles and piles of CVs. Um, some people just like go through them with some AI, uh, you know, app. So like, how do you decide? I am, so I am now in the process of, of selecting interns and, and, you know, interviewing interns. And it's super hard. Like if you don't know them just through, and now it's, you don't even meet them in person, right? Cause it's like mainly Zoom calls. Like, yeah. how do you decide? How do you feel like the right, they're the right vibe or like they fit, especially when you're that young, I was actually discussing about this. You have pretty much nothing. You just have your youth and that's perfectly fine. But that, that's where it becomes like harder to figure out, okay, like, why this person and not that person? They're both, you know, they're both studying. They're both great at what they're studying and like enthusiastic and young and fresh. And so like, how do you differentiate between this person and that person? So like yeah. when you meet someone, you get to like feel that person vibe and like their personality and like whether or not they're passionate. And, you know, like you, you get to understand a little bit more about them, especially at that early age. Cause like afterwards, sure, you, you build a portfolio, you build a CV, you build like a lot of like background that supports you sure. in a, in an application. But when you're 20, you don't really have much. You know? like, yeah, there's nothing that separates you because um, this is one of the things that uh, one of my professors said in the first, in my first semester, he basically said, Vinay, turn around and look at this lecture theater. There's 300 people here. There's nothing that differentiates you from other person here. And so I completely uh, agree. And yeah. obviously being on the hiring side, um, but this is where small, small things can set you apart, like um, sending like a really nice follow up email after For a call sure. and yeah. uh, or like just meeting them in person at a networking event, keeping in touch. But I think also with things like LinkedIn, it's gone a bit crazy as well, because if I go speak somewhere, um, I probably get like 50 connection requests uh, straight after that. And it's just yeah. a bit crazy. But um, I know that we that we have another overlap because you worked on an MGF uh, project back in 2017, 16, 17, 18, one of those yeah. few years, right? Uh, yeah. So in Saudi Arabia, which must have been very different because I spoke at that event in 2022, so two years ago. And um, somebody from- Pride and joy, because I've started that program as a program director. I, I did the very first MGF. Oh, and wow. That's extremely, extremely like proud because it grew. So, I mean, it's not because of me, but it's just like, you know, when you start something and you see that growing so, so beautifully, you're always like, ah, 
I'm so happy. It, was, it was crazy. So in 2022, when we were doing it, it was at a royal palace and it was a two day thing and 20,000 students and young people attended it. And I must have spoken to, I felt like I spoke to 20,000 people at that day by the end of those two days, but it was insane. And so anyway, we'll come to that. But um, just going over some of the things that you just briefly mentioned. So um, you said you're a huge advocate for switching jobs and trying different things in your 20s, if, especially if things are not kind of, Looking from the outside, you might have a perception of a company or an opportunity, but when you're working inside, it's usually very different to how you yeah. perceive it. And yeah. um, that, and I also want to bear in mind something that you said with your colleagues. Some of them start off as interns or in graduate roles within that company and kind of just work their way up. So um, with those two kind of approaches, what are your thoughts and what would you kind of generally say in terms of advice to people in their 20s who are kind of not sure if they want to stick it through and potentially get a promotion in six months, 12 months or go somewhere else and perhaps the grass may not be greener? Yeah, it's it's so interesting. I think it's a personality. Um, it starts with your personality, right? Like. And it's also like, obviously, how risk adverse you are. Um, again, sure. you're an entrepreneur, so you probably are very risk adverse. Um, and as I said, I've never really been like, I feel like I've never really wanted like a super clear uh, or like corporate. My, my parents are entrepreneurs. I think it's worth saying that I, I grew up with entrepreneurs in a very entrepreneurial type of environment. They started their business pretty much when I was born. Um, I, I didn't really want to go into entrepreneurship um, because I saw how hard it is. Mm. <laughs> um, I don't blame you. <laughs> it, it wasn't just hard. It was just like one of those things like life and death every day. So for me, it was like, wow, like, no, I want to, I actually wanted to take, for me, like the career side was the safer bet, sure. um, especially at the beginning. And it was also like a little bit of like, as you said, right, like you're unemployed, but th that's exactly what my parents say. Like for them, it's like, it's either the business is going to work or, we have nothing, right? So for me, it was yeah. a little bit like, I want to have more chances to explore more before I get to a point where I commit fully to something that I actually want to build or I you know, want to be committed to. But like having that in mind, so my brain was always like, I am going to go out there to find like the best thing. And if I don't find the best thing, I know that eventually I want to become an entrepreneur. So I, want, I know that eventually I want to like, if I do stick to something, it's going to be something that I build, right? So I sure. think that's like the type of, mentality that helped me be very you know change and flexible and generally like yeah like i did have a bunch of moments when you know i was never like i never got to like i don't know um president of a company because i stuck around six years um sure. obviously you advance when you change roles but it's always like harder to get like those like super high level positions right um and i did have friends that stuck with an organization for three four years and that by the time we were like 25 or 26 they're like executive director right mm -hmm. um and i had moments when i was like oh maybe i should have done the same maybe i should have like stuck to different organizations now in retrospect because it's beautiful when you're able to look in ret retrospect um for me this worked because i yeah. never my, my mantra was like don't wake up with a regret that you didn't do that like don't sure. wake up at 40 and feel like, wow, I really wish I would have gone. And when I, when I took the, the diplomacy internship, it started as an internship here in New York. I was working for like a super strong Petrom OMV, which was a super, super strong corporation in Romania that, you know, was oil and gas, like was pretty much one of the best places to work in at the time. And in front of me was this beautiful career that I could have done with them. Right. And I remember like when I left the, the director that I was working with was like, whoa, like we want to offer you a position. We want to like, you know, have you and grow and blah, blah. So if you go, maybe you go for three weeks, but then you come back. And I, I never came back. And I always like, I didn't regret it, but I always thought like sure. if I would have gone back, I would have had a very different, you know, career trajectory. Um, so I think it depends. Like my advice is like to really n try to know yourself as much as possible. There are a lot of people that uh, by the time they're 14, they know exactly what they want to do. So for them, it's like much easier because they know like, oh, I want to work in oil and gas or in advertising or I, I want to or I want to build my own company. So it's very easy. They know it. I think I thought I knew. But then mm. every time I went into something and I realized like, well, I didn't like I don't like this or this is not what I thought it is. Like there was this voice in my head that was like, OK, like you don't have to stay here. You can just go and try something else. So like sure. you build like a little bit of these muscles of, of, I feel like 
facing your fears of changing because it is sure. it's always like you're always like starting from scratch with a new team a new company a new position a new um but also like being excited like for me it was also the excitement of like something new i'm gonna meet new people i'm gonna have like a new uh exposure to new environment and um yeah like I, for me like that's what it was and it, it still is i feel like even now like i'm i I would never, I don't think I would ever stay just for the sake of staying and hoping that in the six years or 10 years, I will get to like a certain position. I think for sure. me, it's more like, what's my experience, what I'm learning, who am I working with? Am I not waking up happy every morning, but am I excited about what I'm doing? Sure. Yeah. That's really important. Yeah. Find your why. I think it's really find your why and then try to like respond that why as much as, much as you can, as best as you can. That's my advice. Sure. So on that note, so when do you know it's the right time to move? Oh, this is such a great question. I um, I was in a in a conference in a like whatever video call um, with this incredible writer, and she was talking about you know like this society is encouraging us to stay, to keep mm. going, to be resilient, right? And it's like leaving anything, a job, a relationship, a country is always seen a little bit like you're giving up unless you're leaving yeah. because you have an, an, another opportunity that's, you know, bringing you to like a better, better level. Either you failed or you're a traitor. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's always hard to leave because, and, mm. and she was saying that basically studies shown that by the time we make the decision to leave, we are already like around six months later than when we were supposed to actually leave. But like our sure. brain didn't like process that for like six months. So when is when do you know? For me, it's always like now, again, in retrospect, then I did a lot of the decisions were just like out of like, oh no, I want this and I have an, an opportunity would present itself. So that's a very different sure. scenario when like literally you get like another opportunity and you're like, okay, do you want this? Take it. And then you leave because you want to take that. Um, or like, just like you feel inside, like something is not good. And you like keep feeling that for long enough. Like I did, like I had one job that was an amazingly paid job in New York. It was super cool in like tech and so on. I was like waking up, I don't know, not just not feeling it. Like I didn't want to wake up every day. And I, mm. and I knew like, this is a great job. It's a super well paid. I have an executive position, all of that. Right. But on like, paper, I, it's great. On like, paper, on paper. Great. But, like yeah. I was not like, I didn't feel like that's what I'm supposed to. Do. And I remember like I said it out loud to a friend. And then like in a few days after that, like, you know, I had a conversation with the founder and like everything like pretty much like fell into place. Cause I really believe like once you're able to like vocalize what you want yeah. to do, somehow the universe, you know, comes around and either pushes you to do it, you know, like you get fired or, you know, something <laughs> happened or like really like helps you to do it. You know, like another opportunity comes along or something, you know, something else. So I think it's, it's two ways. Like you either like, but it's hard because if you don't know that you want to go, then you're not going to look for other opportunities, right? So like you yeah. kind of have to like decide and either put it on paper or say it out loud or, you know, make a little bit of a commitment and then just look for, or either look or just be open, you know, like open up for new opportunities. Like LinkedIn, for example, you can put that, you know, open for opportunities or, or something tag in your photo. Like that's like a sign, a very, now a very clear oh, sign for everyone. Your thoughts, <laughs> oh, I would love to ask you about this. What if one of your colleagues put that up about they're still working at Endeavor? Oh yeah, that would be weird. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I've never, Every time I left, I already had something else that I was living to, right? Sure. So um, I think that's a good idea, right? Only so, when I left to start my own thing, I had nothing. And I was sure. like, kept living and we'll see. Um, and that was terrifying. I think it's terrifying when you leave and there's like really, you have no idea what you're living to. It's like jumping off a cliff, right? You just yeah, like, you just really, like I remember cliff. like I felt like, like for a few days, I was like, like, I, I don't know, I couldn't even speak. I felt like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. It, like it, it just gets so... Yeah, um, I don't know. Like I normally, so I've never really put that on LinkedIn. I do think mm. during these days, you know, there's so much layovers in big companies, in tech companies, like there's so much happening. And I always appreciate the courage of people to come up there and say like, I'm leaving this or I've been laid off. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, this is what I am good at. Like if you know, any, I think that's, that you, you need so much courage. I don't know if I would be able to do that. Yeah, um, I agree, I, I agree. I respect this. Uh, I feel like it's a development of our society of which we vulnerability is no longer like a seen as a bad thing. It's starting to be yeah. seen as a, 
as a courage. And I think the generation coming, by the way, they're they're really gonna change the the game. I mean, I've heard like crazy things from people like just not showing up to their jobs the second day without them saying anything just because they didn't like it. And I mean, like very young people to sure. like, you know, people showing up and being like, hey, like, I don't like this, like, I need to change this, or I want more from this. Or... So I think it, they're really like coming up with like, great, brave ideas of how to like, I think they're very courageous, right? I think, exactly. uh, yeah. I feel like they, they have a lot more courage, and they're a lot more outspoken than the previous generations. I think yeah. if they don't like something, they're not happy, uh, that's something they're not happy about. They're very vocal about it and they're not afraid to talk about it. And I think but that's a really good thing. It's also because, so my parents, I mean, my parents are an exception in their generation because they're entrepreneurs, but basically that generation, and especially the generation before them, those are generation of people that finished school, got a job, stayed in a job, retired from the job. That was it. Um, even my parents, I mean, they started this business. They stayed in the business. Like maybe they would have been like, if, like maybe a new entrepreneur would have like stopped and done different businesses five times, right? Like they just sure. stuck because they're like, this is what we know how to do. This is what we're going to do. Um, so they were not necessarily that flexible. They didn't really understand this concept of like, like my parents have employees that have been there for like 20 something years. Mm. And like, that's pretty much like the generation. So I feel like my, like our generation, we've started doing a little bit of like jumping around, moving, changing jobs, being like a bit more flexible. And like, of course, sure. the generation that comes, you know, after us was like a lot of their like, the, the, their parents also have been more courageous and there's also like a little bit of a safety net sure. um, because they're they're able to like you know give them a little bit more security um i mean i expect my daughter to like don't take no for an answer in any and like never say like she's two now but so she has a lot but like because you know i'm her model in a way right like i'm the one sure. setting up so like how am I going to be like, oh, no, you have to stay and like stick to this because or like stick to this school or stick to this job because that's going to be good. like I won't be able to say that I didn't I didn't do that. So I, I won't be able yeah. to tell her like to do that. So I think that's why they're they're becoming much more courageous because they do have other role models. And also, like we've seen, I mean, there's this book. It's an amazing book. It's called The Portfolio Life. Um, and it really talks about exactly this, like where yeah. a whole new generation, you don't have to be just a doctor or just a lawyer or just like whatever you are in a career that you've studied, you can be pretty much anything that you want to be based on your, what you're good at, what your skill are, skills are, but also what your passion and your interest is. So, sure. you know, for me, if you look at my career, like, what, like what, what is she? I studied law, but I also studied diplomacy, but I also studied like PR and advertising. I worked in consultancy. I worked in diplomacy. I worked in tech and I did my own company. And now I work as, you know, in, in partnerships, like it's, it's all over the place. You cannot really like find like a red link between all of them and say like, oh, this is why it makes sense. But yeah. it does make sense for me. And I feel like all the skills add it up. And also like, I feel like, you know, because I've done so many different things, something, and even now I, I also teach. I forgot to say that, but I, I'm an executive course facilitator for Stanford and I teach design thinking and I love it. I literally love it. It's one of like the best things that I've you know, started doing for like a few years now. Um, but it's OK. It's OK to not just be one thing or associated with one part of your life or your career um, and to be courageous enough to say, like, I also like to draw. I don't like to draw, but like, I don't know. There are people yeah. who like super artistic. There are people who like music, like a lot of the entrepreneurs these days are at least like either DJs or they do like two other gigs on the side, right? I think it was like Morgan Stanley or JP Morgan CEO. He's like a DJ on the side as well. Uh, yeah, which is quite... So like on that topic, it's quite interesting because I think um, if you go back to our parents' generation or the generation before that, a lot of the roles were fairly historically, not much has changed. But I think the roles today, no one's done it before. And so essentially there's no playbook to how to do a job. And often you're high based on your skill set and your past experiences and being agile and being comfortable being uncomfortable is something that they value. And so I fully understand where you're coming from. Um, I think this kind of nicely ties to like your current role at Endeavor. So um, One from of the values of Endeavor is always agile, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I say um, I talk a lot about being comfortable being uncomfortable because um you can't do you know the the days of doing like a nine to five job where you turn up every day is the same you do the same thing over and over again those days are probably long gone or at least if that's your job you probably should think twice about what you want to do in the future uh, those are jobs that are going to taken up by those are the things that can be automated can be taken yeah. away a lot of people worry about 
the t- losing their jobs, etc. So if you do the same thing, and if it can be, it's very repetitive, it's going to go, it's probably started to go already. And so start doing things where there's no playbook, and you kind of have to use your head and there's yeah. no playbook. And um, we'll come to some of your book recommendations in a second, because I was going to come to that in a second. But um, your work at Endeavor, um, Endeavor as an organization. So uh, do you want to just quickly br- uh, brief our listeners to what Endeavor does, and then we'll go a little bit more into entrepreneurship? Yeah, sure. Um, So Endeavor has been around for 27 years, uh, started by um, uh, Linda uh, in Latin America. And the the idea behind it was pretty much like entrepreneurship is not just in Silicon Valley. Entrepreneurship exists everywhere in the world, but like it just doesn't have the right tools and the right ecosystem and the, you know, the right framework around it to 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 evolve and to, to grow. So she had this incredible um, kind of like insight in her, in her mind. And she went and started um, this organization and supported entrepreneurs to, to grow in all these markets that were at that point emerging. And there was no, not like an entrepreneurial ecosystem in place. And sure. one thing that I really love about, um, about the, the, like our, our theory is you know, she says, like, when she was going to these markets, mainly uh, Spanish speaking markets, there was not even a word for entrepreneurship, like entrepreneurs didn't have a word to define themselves. And I come from Romania, which is a former communist country, um, which pretty much means that until, you know, for the time of communism, everything belonged to the governments, like it was state owned, there was no private sector, it didn't exist. So I have a very similar experience of my parents starting this business pretty quickly after the fall of communism. And there was no word to define what they were doing. So, you know, when you go to school and they ask you what your, you know, what, what does your mom do? What does your dad do? Um, I had, I didn't know what to say that they're doing. And I remember like I was making up because I, I would come home and I would ask him, what do you guys do? And they would be like, we're administrators or like, you know, we're, we're, or accountant because like, my sure. mom was in the accounting. Um, so basically the whole organization is, off by and for entrepreneurs, which pretty much means like we want to support entrepreneurs uh, in emerging markets, but now we're pretty like 42 markets, which is huge. Um, and we're also in Europe, um, besides Latin America, we're in, we're in the Middle East, we're, we're pretty much all over the world at this point, um, in the US as well. So the, the, the idea of the organization is uh, we support entrepreneurs by giving them access to to funding by giving them access to mentors, access to talent, um, and really like connecting them and supporting them in their journey. Um, one thing that differentiates us from a lot of other organizations that support entrepreneurs is that we believe in selecting people that have a multiplier effect potential, right? Which means you as an entrepreneur, Vinay, um, started an organization, um, but it's not just about you and the organization. It's about mm-hmm. how many other entrepreneurs, startups, you know, um, bubbles you create around you. Um, so it's about the people that you hire and then what they go on to do as well and what other organization they start. So we, we kind of like have these bubbles, like the, the multiplier effect bubbles of entrepreneurs, which I really love because that shows like one entrepreneur that can create like a hundred other, you know, entrepreneurs or businesses, or just multiply their effect to a point where the entire market, um, you know, grows and you know sure. has like a, a positive impact. Um, so that's why we call them high impact entrepreneurs as well. And um, their their impact, as I said, is is pretty spread. So it's not just financial; it's also like social, and um, it really can change. And we've seen that we've ch- seen these markets like really change and really grow uh, based on the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem that was built. So that's a little bit of what the organization is doing. Thank you so much, Beatrice. Okay, so. Quite a lot of our listeners are interested in entrepreneurship. So um, at least in the beginning, one of the hardest things to do is to find an idea or a problem that they can solve as a business. So in your opinion, um, are there any particular sectors, problems that you think are ripe for disruption or um, could benefit from entrepreneurs coming in in 2024? So it's so funny because everyone now talks about AI. It's kind Mm. of like the be all and all subject and i mean obviously ai has a very very strong potential to disrupt a lot of the things as you said like a lot of the jobs that are too mechanical or too repetitive and really like unlock our potential as a humanity and i strongly believe in that um but i do think there's still and obviously tech has always been like this great bubble of like wow like you know tech like whatever you do do 
have a technical part or have like some sort of a, a tech. Um, I do believe there's a lot of other industries that can be uh, disrupted. Like, you know, I'm thinking here of like agriculture, of, of feminine care or like feminine, like health for women, which mm. is still like very disproportionate in terms of like the amount of attention that it gets, but also like literally the amount of innovation and, you know, like the products that, that are coming up for, for supporting women and their health journeys. Um, agriculture, because I do think like we still have to, like, it doesn't matter how many new things we manage to do, like new meats or new whatever that are not, are synthetic. But I think like we still need to invest in, in having that, you know, the food and, and the materials and like everything that you can get from, from agriculture. Transportation, to be honest, <laughs> like, I feel like we all live in big cities where we see that it's crazy, right? Like you still stay in traffic. You, like there's still like ac crazy accidents that are happening um, to infrastructure in a way. So I think like there's, you know, like we feel like because of the advances of technology and, you know, we have these flying cars and all these crazy things that are happening, we tend to feel like, wow, like everything has been done or we cannot do anything or like it, it's there. But like, I really believe that in every single sector of your, of your, life day to day, depending on where you are. I think it's very different if you're in India or if you're in uh, Indonesia or if you're in Romania or if you're in New York or if you're in San Francisco or even like, in a I don't know, in Detroit or like a, another place in, in the US that's not like one of the major cities. Um, you can innovate in, in something, in a, in a journey or a, a user journey that you see that's not working well, like from, I don't know, the way you shop for, you know, your daily product uh, to the way you get home or to the way you like you know, do your different processes uh, for work. Um, and there can be like small innovations and big innovations. Sometimes I think tends like that small innovations are the ones that are having like a really big impact. Um, so I really think like there's everything that can be still disrupted, not necessarily disrupted, just like made better. And it's also like a bit of a, um, a little bit of like sector specific and uh, country specific. Hmm. Uh, and region specific like there's a, like a lot of things that in some countries are fully blown off and they're going really well but then in other countries they're not yet and you know it's still like a lot of work that you have to do and you probably know that really well um and generally like you know people like i feel like it's uh, and talent and new talent and what are we going to do with the new talent you know especially yeah. with the, the with the ai like how are we you know like i have as i said i have a, a young a young daughter and i am terrified like what what is it gonna happen like like is she still gonna be able to be an artist if she wants to be an artist or is that be going to become like a very different thing or is she you know will i train her to be an entrepreneur like should i take her to like this school of like only doing like you know i, I mean there is like this entrepreneurship um academy i mm. think that started in um in amsterdam and it's now in romania and i met a group of students they're all like super young but they all already like had at least one business that failed and they're like at the second business and the way they pass each year is by proving that their business is profitable i was sure. like mind blown like that's incredible like that like wow they're like if their academy is like that now like can you imagine like the impact that that's gonna have on like the new entrepreneurs of tomorrow um and it was very funny talking with one of them like he is basically his business is around making better pillows sure and, like sure. You know, like small things but like he you know yeah. he's super excited so um and then there's like the whole like you know world of like everything that has to do with the you know the, the not just the artificial intelligence but like blockchain and you know that whole world so I, I do think there's like a lot personally if i would still go into something right now and i hope you know a lot of people still think that they can change i would find ways that are creating more solutions for not just climate change, I think it became a little bit of a, a word that like no one really believes anymore, but we still obviously have to think about that. But just yeah. like have a little bit more into like, okay, how can we change things, but in a way that has a good impact, not just on the people, but also on the planet, right? Like how can we design sure. a better way of doing healthcare, a better way of doing infrastructure, of doing tourism, you know, education, um, by, by having like a little bit of an, like caring about, the planet as a as another player in this whole you know situation because we sure. still need this planet to live on and we only have one so yeah um elon might disagree but <laughs> i <laughs> i understand exactly uh, so this... he's doing a lot like he started i don't know now probably he changed but you know elon was the first to start thinking into like you know how can we do it a bit better for the planet so yeah
I change. agree. I think this is an area that um, I've been thinking a lot about as well because I get asked this quite a lot, and I've kind of come to um, three kind of very simple things to kind of look out for if you're looking to start a business. One is, you know, you got. Uh, can you do something that's better than what's already been done at the moment? Or the second option is cheaper. Can you do the same thing, but cheaper? And the third option is basically ideally both. And if you can do it better and cheaper, then you're going to be onto something. But it's really interesting because um, a lot of things uh, can be done in a very different way. So as an example, um, you know, if you ask 50 years ago, if you go back 50, 60 years ago, and you ask someone that was doing dishes, as an example at home, and ask them, okay, what if we kind of solve this problem for you? You don't have to do dishes. The first thing they were probably thought about is like, oh, let's get a robot that will wash the dishes. But then you kind of realize that actually having a dishwasher is a lot more efficient. You're the, so there's a, so using that analogy, there's a lot of things where it's done in a very mechanical and a very inefficient way today that can be done in a very discreet and more efficient way that can be done. So as an example, like I'm quite privileged in the sense that we work with over 2000 companies around the world and, it's amazing to see some of the, the employers that we work with to see some of the solutions. So one of the companies that we work with is actually working on flying cars at the moment. So um, the, it looks like a Batmobile. Um, anyone check it out. It's got Bellwether. Really cool concept. I think um, their trailer just got released and it had like millions of views on YouTube. So really, really cool company. So it's just those kind of things where it's like mobility has gone from, you know, horses to cycles to cars to now airplanes and then you know faster cars and now you're just kind of rethinking the whole thing and thinking okay what's the problem we've got traffic as we were talking about this just before the podcast like traffic as an example okay so what if we just completely like just get rid of the traffic problem and just fly through all of this and so it's just really interesting because how can you start doing things where the problem is just solved in a completely different way than what's been done at the moment so that's quite interesting um i think it's always like in line with that is like what's what do you see as a as a thing that doesn't work as a process mm. that doesn't work or what's something that but like the the first question that i would start with is what do you deeply care of or like mm. for you know what's something that really really interests you and the the way to look at any new innovation is you know do you spend enough time looking into that problem with like a different perspective yeah. Um, I think a lot of the super big innovations of this world were done by people that were just purely interested and in very simple, as you said, dishwasher or like, you know, driving a car. Or like They were very, very interested in different topics and they were just able to look at them from a different perspective and see how they can be done better. And I, I 100%, I mean, banking, you know, like banking was a thing that we thought, wow, it's done. We have the banks, everything is great. But like yeah. now, majority of our portfolio from the, endeavor entrepreneurs are in fintech because in lot in a lot of these emerging markets the one thing that doesn't really work almost at all is banking <laughs> so yeah. you know they yeah. innovate on payments they innovate on credit they innovate on so many things um and just like and I, we had like our honorary um for our gala last year was david velis from new bank which is a a new bank from from Latin America. And, you know, he was telling us like he basically moved to a new country in Latin America and he just couldn't open an account. And that's what made it's him crazy. think like, this is not possible. Like it, it cannot, like this cannot be this hard to open an account in a bank and it cannot be like so tedious and complex and so on. So, you know, that's how he started. Like he wasn't, he was, I think he was working in investment. He had a great job. He, he, he wasn't like looking to become an entrepreneur and, so, and solve a, a huge problem, especially in a, in a market like that was super emerging. And, but for him, it was like, this is a problem. Like I'm sure other people have the same problem that I have. And I am sure that you can do this better. And now he's doing like, you know, amazing with, with, new bank and creating like a new way of banking. Um, so I, for me, it's always that, like I, what I wanted to do, for example, what was my business that for the time being, I would say it didn't fail. It just like it stopped was to do better, uh, intimate care products for women out of materials that are not toxic. Um, sure. why? Because I was looking around and everything that you had was super toxic, but they were just like, I mean, it's almost like, you know, tampons are OB. OB is a company, but it's like Uber, right? Like now Uber became like a, it's not just a brand. It's like your Ubering is like a whole, yeah. it's a verb. It became, so it was the same, right? Like the, the product and the brand became so big that it was almost impossible for anyone to think you could actually have another product yeah. that's better than that product. But now, and this is like 
almost five years later, there's so many new products. There's like so many, and like this whole conversation started around like, okay, like how can we do better products? There's yeah. like, there has to be a way to do cleaner, better, nicer products that are good for the planet, but also they're good for our bodies, right? So I think yeah. in everything that you look at, like, you know, how can we do better clothes? How can we stop this craziness of like having, you know, like the, the whole clothing industry is one of the major impacting uh, industry in terms of like climate and, you know, how it like dirties our, our environment. Like, yeah we have to figure out to do it better. You know, like, like everything, like all these things, like we've came this way because we wanted to do, you know, we wanted to do more clothes cheaper, as you say. Yeah. And now we got to a point where like, okay, I think we've done enough of clothes cheaper. Like, let's figure out how we actually do, you know, maybe less clothes, maybe Just not do better now. Do it better. Um, yeah. And then the other thing is like, you know, like how do we figure out like how we work? Like there's so much discussion now about hybrid work because of the pandemic mm. and all this work like do we work better in a hybrid way do we work better like i would say like i always i was a big you know um, ambassador of working remote because for me it was always like if you have a job that requires you to work with people from other countries then it doesn't make sense for you to be in the office like i mean it makes sense in certain occasions where people come together and you brainstorm and you but like otherwise like i can be anywhere and work because I, I won't like I won't have you know video like video calling probably changed so much for us, um, but yeah like I, I think every single like it it really starts with like what are you interested in what do you deeply care about and also like what really bothers you like, sure. you see something in your daily life that you're like okay like I don't know this milk is not okay we need to like or like anything or like my coffee my coffee can be better or my coffee cup can be better or you yeah. can innovate on so many different things and, and there's also like talking about flexibility. I don't think these days you need to have that background. Like I have a lot of friends that went into healthcare businesses or, you know, businesses in which they they weren't doctors or they didn't have that background because you can learn, you can talk to people, you can get, you can get the knowledge. The knowledge is no longer like a prerequisite. I mean, you can go into a, a, to do like a law, like a a type of like innovating in in law without you actually having practiced law. Yeah, uh, because you see like a problem that you can fix and you can find someone to give you like all oh, like you can find multiple people to advise you on like the the more like technicalities of the of the job. And these days you can even be a coder without knowing how to code, you know, so yeah, like, it's, it changes uh, the game. I think sometimes it gives you an advantage not coming from that background, because I guess you're not kind of weighed down by uh training in terms of just being told how to you essentially have blinkers when you become an expert in an area yes. you kind of have blinkers on you just do it in like without really looking at it and coming from the outside from yes. a very different perspective it could be really really helpful so that's that's actually a really good point i think um i think from what you just said i think what i can probably say is it's find things that frustrate you as a person yeah and then that's probably a good place because if you're frustrated i'm pretty sure there are other people that yeah. have that similar uh, feeling and then if something could be done better on the back of that that's probably a good place to start I guess yeah uh, I, that's interesting I'm a design thinking uh, course facilitator so I have to say like in design thinking you always say like you you can start before you listen to the user before you sure. you really go out there and you say okay I have this problem do you have this problem do you mm-hmm. have this problem like how many have this problem and then like also like be a little bit aware of because that gives you product market fit as you know it's one of the most important thing to have um but in the same time i also i'm a little bit like and i hope my colleagues won't hear this um there are a lot there's a lot of innovation starting Mm. with the car ford's story for me is like one of the most incredible stories when he asked people if they want the car they were like 100 percent no we because they didn't know what the car was right so like you know like the story of him starting the with the car and putting like the head of a of a horse so that people would like buy the car because they would see the horse. So for me, like that's also like a little bit of a, yes, you have to listen to the, like and you, you kind of have to like do both. You have to come up with an idea, uh, listen when I, that's why I failed in a way, right? Because I was super sure that if I'm going to do this product out of hemp, that at the time, no one was really like, it was starting to be a thing again, because it was sure. a thing years before, but, but like no one was really, like it was mainly associated with cannabis or like the, yeah. the drop, right? So when I was talking about like, oh, I want to do feminine care products out of hemp, people were like, what's that? <laughs> yeah. um, and it was like, 
am I going to put that in my body? Will that be so? And even like, even now, like it's, I know a company that started kind of in the same time as I did and they just launched some product and it's still like, it's very hard to, to explain and to, so to train the people, right. Uh, and to make them feel like you actually need these because so it's a lot of like education, yeah. but unless you find that product market fit and unless you figure out like, maybe you don't do a product first, maybe you do like an app that teaches people about that certain problem, right? Um, because you might find that you have an amazing idea. People just don't understand what your idea is. They're super used to doing things the way, the way they are doing it. And then they sure. are refusing that idea, not because it's not great, but because they are afraid of like change and they don't understand it, right? So it's always like, it's very hard. And let's face it, entrepreneurs, I mean, how many entrepreneurs fail every, every year? 93 percent according to exactly. stats is 90 percent plus so yeah that's the thing you, the hardest you job you can go for <laughs> literally the hardest job you kind of have to have a certain threshold for pain and yes. uh and you kind of have to have a you develop a thick skin i think there's a whole different set of skill set that you develop as an entrepreneur and i'm um i what I want, I have a daughter as well, roughly the same age as yours. She's, and my daughter is 16 months old. And oh, wow. would I want my daughter to go through the same journey I had? Perhaps not. But would I want her to start a business and learn the skills from being an entrepreneur? I would say absolutely yes. I think it, um, sometimes being in a company, you just, you know, you, you sometimes, so my wife has a very traditional job. Um, she started as an intern in that company and she's been there for over 10 years and See? she's a senior manager. And it worked out really well for her. And but the thing is, you you get told what is possible and what's not possible, and you start accepting that in certain situations. And I think as an entrepreneur, you just refuse to take no as an answer. Or if someone says this can't be done, you're like, no, you're wrong. I'm going to figure out a way how to do this. That's the first thing as an entrepreneur. You get conditioned to do that, where you kind of start thinking outside the box and you start yeah you stop taking no for an answer and i think that's a very good skill set to have you will soon realize that your daughter already knows that so i feel like kids at this age their favorite word is no and yeah. for me it's crazy to see how decisive i mean my my daughter is 21 months so a bit a bit older so she started speaking a little bit and for me like it's a lesson because mm. I look at her and I know all of us were like that. It's not, it's not special. It's like, let's, this is developmental stages of humanity. And she's so like, she knows, she knows when she's hungry. She knows when she's not, she knows when she wants yeah. to do something. Like, I feel like society and exactly what you said, like different working in different organizations or different jobs or different regimes or different, you know, like they t start like to tame us. Yeah, and, like make us uh, think like we can do things to be afraid to like have all these like mentality type of um, I don't know block blockers. Yeah, um, but that's how we are. Like we are born entrepreneurial. We are born yeah. wanting to do what we want to do. We are born thinking that no, no, no. I'm gonna push. Like literally, she would go to something that she knows she's not allowed to do. She would look at me. She would be like, no, and she would do it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something beautiful to see as a parent, but also just like a human, because you get reminded of like, wow, like, no, 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 we, that's how we are. <laughs> we just yeah. become like afraid and we become like wanting to like go like with the norms and so on, because that's what society tells us that we have to do. So I think, it, and it's a beauty, right? Like India, I think it's a great entrepreneurial country. US, it's an amazing entrepreneurial, but like, look at Romania, like, in Romania, when you go home and you tell, even me, like my parents are entrepreneurs. When I went home after 10 years of like doing a more, you know, clear or like, I don't know, a traditional career path. And I said, I'm done. I want to become an entrepreneur. My parents were like, what happened? <laughs> Why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you lose your job? Like, like, you know, it's almost like it's, it's seen as something that you do because everything else failed. So now you have yeah. to say that you're it's crazy. Like, I feel like we, we need to change that and we need to change that for our kids for sure. And I agree. Uh, I think I can speak to you about this for whole, like, you know, exactly. hours and hours, but um, I just have two, two quick uh, questions and then we'll kind of quickly wrap up. Um, so um, for me, I always ask my guest, um, Beatrice of today, uh, what advice would you give to Beatrice of 20 years old? That's such a good question. I never thought about it. Um, to enjoy life more, to be more relaxed, um, and to trust the process a little bit more. I was really, really willing to trust, design, curate, and you know, really like control the process a lot. I was a workaholic, like terrible workaholic. I had like you know 
at some point I was like sleeping 45 minutes or whatever. Mm. Um, I think you know that very well. <laughs> um, Familiar with the concept. <laughs> sure. So yeah, to, 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 to take a little bit more breaks, to be more present and to really trust the process more that the process will like take you where it needs to, where you need to go and not have like, I had these like five years plan, 10 years plans. I knew what I want to do by the time I was 25, by the time I was that. Obviously, you know, life plays with you a little bit, like kind of like you always like are, are proven that mm, your plans are not necessarily what's going to happen. But that like the fact that you want them to happen and you're so strict with kind of your vision um, creates a lot of unnecessary pain. <laughs> and sure. you know, so that's what I would tell her. I, I mean, I, still, I, I would still say that to be a series of 30 years because I feel like I'm still not learning those lessons. <laughs> I think sometimes you just get, um, you get set in your ways, but also I kind of also, I think it's my wife who reminds me, she's just like, okay, but that's what made you who you are today. Yeah. And so if you are a lot more chill or a lot more kind of other things that you kind of wanted to be different, you wouldn't be the person that you are today. And yeah, you wouldn't be here sure. giving advice to the 20 year old person. No. So, uh, I think one thing is for me, and probably you wouldn't give that advice to the 20, 20 years old you, is to be more courageous and to really, to, to go and do whatever ideas I had. I had so many, like I wanted to do so many ideas when I was 20 that it's crazy. I would still do them now. And for me, it's sure. like, why didn't I do it? And I didn't do it because I was, you know, I had this like, oh, I had to learn. I have to learn. I have to, I always thought that I need to learn to, and to know everything before I start something. And now I 100% would tell people, no, just start it. You're going to learn on the way. I agree. I think that that's a really good one. I, I think also in your early 20s, you have an advantage because you don't usually have like a mortgage. You don't have dependents. You don't have wife. You don't have kids. Yeah. You don't have yeah. spouses. And I... You know, I don't want to say uh, it, it, you're of, you're very free without realizing that you're very free. Yes. And um, that gives you a lot of freedom that later on in life, it's much you harder. Yeah. And, you know, when you're in your 30s, if you have a mortgage, you have kids, you have uh, a partner, you have, you know, other life things, obligations. It's much harder to start a, a company. I got super lucky. Uh, you know, I'd like to think I'd like to claim I'm a genius, but a lot of this just happened by luck. And you started a company in your 20s, not because I knew all of this, but now speaking to friends who are thinking about starting a company, they're just like, okay, they kind of have like, they feel like they're shackled because they have all these expenses. And there's a, your minimum amount to live for me when I was, 20 was probably like 650 pounds yeah. my rent was like x amount and i could eat for like 70 pounds a month okay that's all i need and yeah. then but now in your if you're in your 30s and 40s it's a lot higher you're talking thousands maybe even tens of thousands depending on your lifestyle to kind of yeah. give all of that up it's very difficult so although i would tell you that we 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 are we have a, an amazing insights team and we've kind of looked at our entrepreneurs and we we've we've did the unicorn founders pathways studies and we actually discover that more and more entrepreneurs are actually starting in their 30s as opposed to their 20s. So I think, I think with a, funding, with yeah, funding I think and etc. Like both. I think it's like the 100% everything you're saying, like I feel it very, very clear. Like, I mean, I took the leap when I was 30. I was still single, so, and I didn't have a mortgage. Um, and I just, you know, I, I could leave New York because obviously New York is super expensive to leave. And, you know, sure. I could leave New York, I could go back to my hometown and, you know, leave like stay in an apartment that didn't cost very much and, and eat like, I mean, food in, in general is not as expensive, especially, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I, I can live with very little food. Um, but the, the problem in your thirties, I think becomes, wow, if I fail now, like, what am I going to do? Right? Like it, it's so yeah. much harder, but when in your twenties and that's, I think for me, it was my, my job jumping or like my, my different trials with like different positions, because I didn't, I wasn't that afraid of failing. Cause I knew like, mm. there's always like, okay, at 25, you can start from zero from an internship anywhere. And it's going to be perfectly fine. You're still 25, right? Like at 35, you can't really start from being an intern. I mean, you can, but it's a bit yeah. harder on your ego. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, like everything you said, um, but there is like a little, like, I feel like there's never too late. And that's something that I am still learning because, you know, after I started the business and it didn't work out, I was like, I'm done. I have to find like, you know, I'm, I'm already 35. It didn't work out. Like, what am I going to do? But like, in a way, if you think, if you look at like so many entrepreneurs, like a lot of them started in their forties and, you know, they had a little different maturity and approach. And obviously if you do have a job, a traditional job that pays the bills and you're able to actually start something on the side and grow it, 
then it's also like a very different position, right? Because you're like, yeah. you're coming from a position where you can invest in your business or you can do a little bit more as opposed to a young person that has nothing. And it's just like, I mean, the drive is probably different 20 versus 30, but also like the funding and the stability. So I, this is to say that I, I think both ways can work, but I think for, cause probably your audience is more like twenties. I, I think for them, yeah, it's an amazing time to start and to try anything like absolutely anything in the world and beyond. <laughs> I agree. I think the only thing I would probably just add to that is, you know, it, I made it sound like, you know, starting in your early 20s, being an entrepreneur in your early 20s is like the way to do it. I, it just to kind of counter at that point, I wish I worked somewhere for a few years, especially go through like a graduate program for two to three years. And there's a lot of mistakes that graduates or young people do in their career at workplace, you know, like certain types of emails, you just know what to say, what not to say, etc. I learned that the hard way. And, you know, I would have loved to make those mistakes while someone else was paying me. <laughs> and then it kind of like, uh, it's uh, j jokes aside, I, I'm, I'm actually very serious about that, because I wish that a lot of the mistakes that cost us early on is completely avoidable. I get colleagues that are probably just work somewhere for a year or two and they come in, they're far smarter than I was and they're not making the mistakes that I was making when I was 21, 22, just because they were trained in a certain way and they kind of made those mistakes while someone else was paying them. And then they started their company and their companies are gonna do a lot better because you're not making those silly mistakes in your, yeah. you know, as a 21 year old. So either way, it works out really well. Uh, what our um, report on on uh, Unicorn Founders Pathways is kind of showcasing that a lot of the the unicorns, you know, the, the entrepreneurs that actually get to, and that's very important. Of course you can start a business, but that might not become a unicorn or it might not go to a point where it's like a, a super, you know, impactful business or global or so on. Um, so that's why the study kind of like looks a little bit into that and you know, what, what makes an unicorn, you know, pretty sure. much. And it's exactly like what you're saying is pretty much what we're seeing um, in the sense of like a lot of them have worked, not necessarily in like super corporate or like tech mm. companies or something, but like for other entrepreneurs. Yeah, they worked for other entrepreneurs, and they worked and they learned with them, with those other entrepreneurs, while them not being the main decision makers. So obviously, they they could learn and they could see what's good and what's not, and then go and and do it better. So I think exactly what you're saying is pretty much something that comes out more and more. And then like there's something to say about education. I mean, I studied, I did this executive MBA at Stanford. Like I wouldn't say that it teaches you things that you don't know. It's actually like. Mm -hmm not because everything like especially in the executive mbas like you you learn a lot of like practical skills so you actually look at case studies but that's what exactly what you said right you get to look into case studies you get to look into like what people did good and what they didn't from an outsider perspective learn from that be able to analyze it and be able to think like wow if i'm in that position what will i do different right so so yeah. i'm not a huge advocate of traditional education but i'm a huge advocate of this type of like um and more like uh, personal development. I think we we as individuals have to continue to develop and to work and to learn and to study. And there's that you never, and you probably know again this very well, I think you never know enough. You can always learn something new. Um, and that's another thing, like when I finished school late because I did a lot of school and mm -hmm. I finished like around 25 and I was like, I'm done, I'm done with school. I don't wanna like, and I feel like there's a lot of like mentality of like, I cannot wait to be done with school and go out into the world and do my own thing. And guess what? I am now 35 and I can't wait to go back and do another course or like learn, like, because it's not just about the book. You, of, of course, you can le read books, you can self teach yourself anything. But when you go into these type of like programs, they're like experts, they're mentors, they're people that like are taught leaders and they mm. can show you tools and skills and, you know, like they can, they can model in a way that you might not be able to think about it yourself. Right. So, so, and also like you meet people and you work yeah. with other people. And I think you learn also from like that interaction with other people. So I think for me, like always like, that's another advice, right? Like never stop learning. Like always yeah, think I about agree. your learning process as something that's a continuous, like you invest, I think it's it's a very nice thing these days. We invest more and more in how we look in, you know, being healthy, being fit and so on. The brain is also a muscle. You have to kind of do the same thing. Like you go to the gym every day. What do you do for your brain every day? You know, what do you do for your yeah. focus? What do you do for, you know, as an entrepreneur? I mean, you probably can talk about this more than ever. 
the main thing you have is yourself. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's, it's just you and your head. <laughs> yeah. So you have to continuously work on that, right? And yeah, like sometimes you learn the hard way, but I'm sure that also you had a gr like a lot of opportunities to like work with incredible people and learn from other people and have mentors and so on. I think it's a, yeah. a game of entrepreneurship is a game. And that's why I love what Endeavor is doing, creating these ecosystems, right? Like it's, it's a game of like having the right mentors, the right, yeah. you know, people that you can talk to and then they can like teach you like okay i have this problem with hiring what can i do you know what yeah. like you know having that that team of like advocates around you that can always like tell you like you know if you do this this is what's going to happen if you don't do and that's because they've either done it or they've seen 100 people doing it and they've learned from yeah. that right so yeah i think it's a yeah so uh beatrice you, um you worked with us and you've had interns from us in the past uh can you just briefly explain or can, it'll be great to kind of know a bit more about your experience from kind of start to the end um what that process looked like and uh was it useful for you yeah so i got contacted uh by Mandri uh, about the, the opportunity. I was super happy because as it turns out, I worked with, um, you know, with me. So I knew about them as an organization. Mandri is fantastic. I mean, I, I'm happy that she feels the same about me, but I really like loved working with her. She's really like on point did like, because we really were looking for talent. We have this super busy time in the fall where we're organizing our, our fundraising gala. And we're always like looking for, for people that can come and join. Um, so, and also like we're a global organization. So we, we love the idea that we can have interns from, from Saudi in particular. Um, everything, as I said, the experience was, was fairly easy in the communication sense. We had like really, seamless communications and then great candidates. Um, I'm sorry that a lot of them were like very fast to go, but like anyway, the, uh, the candidate that we ended up with was, was really fantastic. Um, we had a great relationship. I hope he learned just as much as, you know, we, we learned from him. Um, and it was just like beautiful to have this type of like, normally schools would come in the summer or in like, mm -hmm. like in the US, it's a very strict system where you only get them in their time off or things like that. Um, it was beautiful to have something that was so well taken care of. I, I literally don't think I did anything more than saying we want this person and then I don't think I did anything else, which for me was great because it's just me and my team for now. I mean, it's just me doing fundraising. So, you know, having someone taking care of all these details and not having to like send letters and do all the logistics in the back and so on, and then getting like a global person coming and joining you in New York for, it was really great. So I'm super happy and I can't wait for the, for the next internship. Thank you so much, Beatrice. It's been fantastic having you on the podcast. Thank you. And to all our listeners, thank you so much for listening. Uh, please do follow us on our social channels. All of the links are in the description. And we hope you have a great week. And we'll catch you next week at the uh, next episode. And your regular host, Kalis, will be back. And thank you once again for having me on the uh, podcast as a host. And hope everyone has a great week. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.